Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, just want you to know what a what a blessing it has been to to, to know John and and Don and to have them amongst us and part of our coordinating team. It's incredible. I, the coordinating team uh, I've been part of for several years, but when John joined us, it was like amazing uh, privilege and honor and blessing uh, to have him with us and to hear of Lifeline and the history of Lifeline and all that you do. Just what a blessing and what a complete honor to, to arrive here amongst you and and be able to have the privilege to share the word to this great congregation, this great family, and um, really honored and blessed and challenged. Uh, I've I, I sp- been a missionary to Ecuador for 34 years, so I mostly speak in Spanish, preach in Spanish. Uh, well, with my complexion, people say, well, where'd you learn your English? I say, well, from my mother, uh, <laughs> on my mother's knee. But. Uh, I have to say that coming to England is, is always a lot more intimidating to even than going to Spain. <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's, it's almost like, well, I, I can't even speak my language correctly. <laughs> Where, whereas it's, yeah, they kind of expect me not to speak Spanish perfectly. Uh, but anyway, hopefully, hopefully uh, I'll be understood with my Arizona English. Some people say I, I uh, speak like an old hippie, which I kind of am. So uh, it's it's somewhat understandable. Um, but what a what a blessing! What a joy! It's been a joy since we've arrived here. Just received it's received with such honor and and, and such attention and such love. Uh, even from uh, Gary, who took us on a. We arrived at five o'clock on Friday, so and. In, in, two-hour drive from the airport. And he was so, uh, so joyful and helped us with everything. And it was a great time of fellowship. And, and ever since, and everyone we've met has, has been a blessing. So really looking forward to getting to you know all of you, uh, getting to become part of the family that's uh, our extended family. And, and what, a, what a joy to be joined together, to be joined together with, with, with a family like Lifeline. Uh, uh, incredible. Incredible blessing, and we, it was like when John came and, and we met him and heard from him and, and Don and heard about you guys, it's like, oh, we have the same DNA. We've got the same values and things that we're, we're, we're looking for. And as I, as I prepared the, the, the message for, for this morning, uh, during the last month and a half, uh, you know, you, as, as a preacher, you kind of can look through your, say, well, which one, which one of my old messages were really good? I'm going to pull that one out. That one, that one worked really well. Um, but I, I didn't want to do that. I purposely didn't want to do that. And my wife exhorted me not to do that. So that was good. And the Holy Spirit confirmed my, what, what my uh, wonderful wife, Marilyn, said. said, you need to get a message for Lifeline, for, if you're going to preach to Lifeline during this, this important time in history. And, and so I've really been seeking God for, for a message. And, and, and this morning, you know, it's, it's beautiful how the Lord does that. Because you can prepare something, and then at like 5.30 in the morning, I, I woke up with, with all you guys on my heart. And the Lord said, for a time such as this. And I really believe it was a word that was just came to me so powerful this morning. I really believe that Lifeline has been positioned and prepared for a time such as this. And, uh, and, and that had, I'd never thought about that during the whole time of my preparation, but the, the Lord just dumped it on me uh, this morning. Uh, so what a, what a, what a blessing to, to know that the, the word I have goes along with that, a, t- a real word of exhortation, which that word was given to Esther by Mordecai. Uh, and it was really a, a word of exhortation that you've been prepared, you've been positioned for a time such as this, and don't blow it. And, uh, and I think for all of us, for the whole church, but I think especially for this community, for this family, 
with all that the Lord has done, with all that the Lord has prepared, and at this time of, of reawakening, of reemerging after this pandemic, although there's so many troubles and so many trials, uh, these troubles and trials, like we sang this morning, like the Lord ministered to this morning, is only a time to see his, his power and his authority. One of, the, one of the scriptures that really stand out to me in that regard is 2 Corinthians 16.9, which is a, a prophetic word that came to Asa, a good king who is in the midst of battle and a war and many trials, and he kind of blew it. Because instead of continuing to trust in the Lord, he kind of trusted in his own resources and, and didn't really seek God to provide for him to, to have victory. And the prophet came to him and said this. It says, and, and, and I think this is a, a scripture for the time. It says, for the eyes, it's 2 Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is per perfect toward him. The eyes of the Lord run to and for. How many, how many of us need the God's favor and God's power to be shown on our behalf during this time of, of just immense trouble? And that's what the Lord was ministering this morning, wasn't he? Unfortunately, uh, I, I think it's part of my character, part of... Um, the voices that come to us. I read this scripture and I say, yes, the Lord. And, and, and I just sense as, as, as I read this, the, 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 the passion that the Lord has for us, the desire that the Lord has for us. His eyes are going to and fro throughout the earth and he's, he's looking to show his power in our favor. And this is a perfect time for that because we have a lot of need for that. Uh, as, as the ministry went this morning. And, but when, whenever, whenever I usually read this, it says, uh, for those who have uh, a, a heart whose heart is per perfect toward him, it's like, oh, well. And I hear these voices say, you really don't qualify. Perfect heart? Mm. But you know, that's just the, the accuser saying that. Because if we're under the blood of Jesus Christ, if we love him, if we're, if we're saying in our hearts, like we were called to say this morning, all I need is you, Lord, then we qualify. And, and that's, that's what the Lord was ministering. He wants to show his favor. He wants to show his power in our, uh, on behalf of us. Just cry out to him, trust in his grace. I remember the, really the, the only time in my life I've heard probably an audible voice. I don't think it was God's audible voice. I, I, I think in a context, it was probably an angel. I'd just recently been married, got married young at 19 with the, my wonderful bride, who's still my bride, through many years. Um, and w working part-time jobs, flipping hamburgers, paying for my own university, Paying for, paying, working together. I had everything I owned was in one suitcase. Uh, I could put it in one suitcase, an old beat up suitcase. Um, and I was just sitting before the Lord, you know, thinking of all my needs and all the this, this stress and the future and how am, how am I going to get through this? I was just, I'd only been a Christian for like four or five months. I was just sitting there meditating before the, before the Lord, and, and I just heard this strong voice say, what do you want? And man, if, you, if, if you're thinking about all your needs and all your problems and all your, all your challenges, and all of a sudden you hear a voice say, what do you want? And kind of like that, I was like, oh, you don't give an answer real quick. So I thought about it for, for quite a while. What do I want? And even though I was a young Christian, the only thing I could say is, all I want is more of you, Lord. It took me a while to come to that, thinking, you know, what do I really want? That's all I want. And the voice said so clearly, the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want. <sighs> what a blessing that, that's been. 
for the rest of my Christianity. And I think what a blessing this morning that that's what the Lord was ministering to so many of us. So we can really cry out, all I need is you, Lord. All I want is you, Lord. And I think with that, with that heart towards the Lord, he's going to show his power in our favor. Amen. 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 So the message today, really what I got is the Lord is preparing Lifeline to beautify your feet. He's preparing you really to, for binding and loosing. And also you've been prepared, but he wants you to continue emphasizing and re-emphasizing what I call the big ought to. And we'll get to those. First, first of all, the, the beautifying your feet, the kind of a spiritual pedicure uh, that the Lord wants each of, us, each of us to have. And that really comes from, uh, from, Matthew, from Romans 10. Before that, a, a scripture that really st stands out to me in this regard um, is Matthew 11, 11. I always wondered, I don't know if you've ever looked at that, where, where um, Jesus says, among those born of women, which is kind of a strange thing. Is there anyone here who wasn't born of a woman? <laughs> no, extra, no extraterrestrials. Um, he says, there, there has arisen none greater than John the Baptist. And even if you look at just that part of it, I mean, None greater than John the Baptist. He was talking about prophets. None greater than John the Baptist. I mean, he didn't. Prophets in the Old Testament raised the dead. They multiplied um, flour and oil. They separated the Red Sea and did all kinds of crazy miracles. What did John the Baptist do? None greater than John the Baptist? What makes him so great? And then it goes on to say, and yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And I, I, med I meditated on that years ago, and that scripture is like, what, what does that really mean? You kind of, oftentimes, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes you read scriptures like that, and you just go, oh, okay. But it's like, what is, what is Jesus saying? It's like, what makes John the Baptist so great? Like, I asked the Lord that as I meditated on it, and, and I really, I came to the conclusion personally, that what made John the Baptist greater than any prophet of the Old Testament is that one day, standing beside the Jordan River, he said, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Okay, that, that answered that for me. I mean, what an amazing thing. So then why would the least in the kingdom of God be greater than him? Because every day of our lives, if we're in Jesus Christ, we have the privilege, we have the authority, we, ha we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that's really what, 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 what Romans says, Romans 10, 13 through 17. We normally, we normally quote, I think, uh, totally out of context. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I... I Seemed, I, maybe I've been in church too long, but it's, it's, it seems like so often I have that preached to me totally out of context. Like, so if you want more faith, you need to hear more of preaching. Right? You need to study the Word of God more. But that's not what the context says. The context says, whoever calls upon the Lord, the name of the Lord shall be saved. But it says, how are they going to call if they haven't heard? And how are they going to hear if there is no preacher, and how is anyone going to preach if they're not sent? Yeah. And God wants to give us that divine pedicure so that we we'll all know that we're all sent to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And that as we share that news that behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that when people hear that, it produces faith, because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The word of God that you preach, and it doesn't take much. I'm a really introverted person. Kind of the last thing that I ever wanted to do was preach. The last thing I ever wanted to do was get in front of people. 
And uh, when I was a very young Christian, I, I worked in a hospital. And kind of the last thing I wanted to do was really, uh, I, I don't know if it was the last thing I wanted to do, because God calls us, Jamie was saying the other, other day, I just met him, he goes, you know, God calls us to get out of our comfort zone. It's like, yeah, I know, I, and I don't like it. Uh, but part of getting out of our comfort zone sometimes is sharing the word. And, and you know, we can just ask God. Uh, I, I have to hang around with guys like Terry and Randy, they always, they're, they're extroverts, so Terry loves to stand in line and share with people, get on planes and share with people. It's like, it's not really my thing. Um, but I know that's what my calling is. And I know that's what all of our calling is, to, to look for those opportunities. But one of the first times I had the opportunity, I was, I was working in a hospital with this gal, and she was reading Psycho-Cybernetics. And crazily, I said, that book doesn't have the answers. And she said, well, then what is the answer? <laughs> and you know, your, your brain works a million miles an hour, right? So I mean, <laughs> my brain immediately said, oh, no, now I'm in trouble. It's like, and, and, and I guess, you know, the enemy also doesn't want us to preach, right? He doesn't want us to say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And it just took all my strength, and it kind of says a lot more about me than anything else, but it took all my strength to just go, Jesus. <laughs> and she said, oh, that's what I need. That's what I've been looking for. And I was able to, we were able to go into the chapel, kneel together, and bring her to the Lord. Wow. And what a blessing. And I guess what I'm saying in that story is sometimes the only word that we have to preach, we don't even say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All we have to say is Jesus. And it's, it's fun working in Ecuador where 95% uh, of the people are Catholic. When we got there, it was like people were not open to the word. And it was like all you had to do is start talking about Jesus. I mean, they're all Catholics, but probably best not to talk about all the things that might be wrong with the Catholic church. <laughs> it wasn't really the best strategy. But you know what the best strategy was? Talk about Jesus. And as soon as you talk about Jesus... Those who receive the gift of faith hear the word of God with just your simple words. And so I just believe the Lord wants to challenge you that you've been prepared. There's, there's so many doors that are open for Lifeline Church. And each one of us is called to walk into those doors even if you're like me, who it's even hard sometimes to, to say to maybe someone you don't know that well, Jesus is the answer, not that book. If that's all you can manage, even that'll work. So let's let's get our feet, let's get in that, that spiritual pedicure that the Lord Lord wants, because He wants each of you to have beautiful feet. Go and, and share the gospel, which is what Romans says there in verse 16. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bringing good, glad tidings of good things. And that's the wonderful thing we preach is the good news, the good news of Jesus Christ. The second thing I want to talk about is, is binding and loosing, which is another scripture that, it goes with another scripture that often is taken out of, out of context. It, it's a scripture in Matthew 18. Because uh, we love that scripture, the, the end of that in verse 20 where it says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. And, you know, that's, we, we can almost, I, I think it's okay to take that out of context to some degree and say, you know, whenever we're together, there's Jesus is with us. Amen? But that's not the context. Well, it is the context, but the context is also important because the context is about binding and loosing. And the Lord really gave me this scripture for Lifeline a month and a half ago when I began seeking God and saying it's really a time for Lifeline to 
be binding and loosing. And remember the call is to make disciples. And making disciples isn't a comfortable thing. It's not a comfortable thing for, for many of us. We don't like to talk about discipline. We don't like to talk about, about correction. We don't like to talk about conflict resolution and being under authority and respecting authority. But that's really what the, what the scripture is really about. And it's about doing the thing that if, like it says in Matthew, if, you, if, if, if your brother has sinned against you, or, or like it says in Galatians, if you see your brother in a fault, go to him with a spirit, one-on-one, -on -one, in a spirit of correction. And I believe that Lifeline has dedicated itself so much to, to discipleship, to fellowship, to, to really coming together as a family. And, 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 I, and that's part of the, the values of AIM, that, 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 that level of relationship. But that level of relationship also means that we have to be grateful and thankful and receive correction in love. And it says, go one on one. It doesn't say, if you see your brother in a fault, get five guys and go, or go around gossip and murmuring about it. No, it doesn't say that. It says, go to him one on one or her and talk to him. And that's probably one of the hardest things to do in Christianity. And it's really hard for me. I, I'd rather find a thousand excuses not to take that first step. And you know what I found? even up till today. Normally when I take that first step, I don't do real well. But I, I'm, I'm continuing to learn. And I'm continuing to be challenged by God that that's our call in love. Both within our marriage, within our family, with, with our friends. <laughs> Sometimes I, I, tell, I tell folks in the church, go, I really want to get close to you and be your friend. It's like, maybe you don't. Because there's, there's a price to pay in friendship. There's a price to pay in, in relationship. But if you want to pay that price, let's go for it. Because that's love. Correcting one another. And that's, that's the scripture. And it says, if, he, if, you're, if, you're, if your brother doesn't receive you, take two or three more. And if he doesn't receive them, bring it to the church. And I believe more than ever, at this time, for Lifeline to move into this time that you've been prepared for, a time such as this, it's going to re require some real boldness, some real courage, some real submission to authority, and some real moving in this scripture of binding and loosing, because that's the context. It says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And uh, I, I, I love preaching here where everybody's dressed casually and and... and but for like 20 years in Ecuador, we arrived in Quink, it was like, okay, we kind of like the people who are preaching to wear a suit and a tie, jacket and a tie. It's like, well, I'm an old hippie, so I don't like to do that. It's like, well, in our culture, that's what we expect. So I had to go out and get a bunch of ties and jackets and put ties and jackets on because that's what was bound by the leadership of our church. And then one day, about 15 years ago, they said, you know what, we're kind of over that. Like, Yay! <laughs> but it, it's kind of a, a silly example, but I, I believe that's the authority that the church has. Whatever's bound or loosed in the local church, that's, that's what we live by. That's how we live in community. That's how we live together in harmony and unity. And I really believe the Lord wants Lifeline to practice that more than ever before. And that's not an easy thing to do. But where two or more are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst of them. And that's what, and, and, and I really believe that in that regard, both in, in Galatians it says, when you, when you go to deal with your brother, it's to restore him. The idea is restoration. I don't believe the church is called to discipline people who repent. I believe they're called to love and encourage people who repent. But people who don't want to repent, we're called to bind and loose. And that's difficult. Um, so we're always seeking people 
seeking to restore. And that's what Paul said. I mean, there was a serious sin that he was dealing with in 1 Corinthians. And he was like, cast this guy out, turn him over to Satan. It's like, wow, how does that work? It's for the destruction of his body and the salvation of his soul. I'm not going to get into all that theology. But pretty intense. But then in 2 Corinthians, he goes, okay, it's okay. He repented. Restore your love to him. Receive him. Encourage him. And that's what, that's what this all needs to be about is just raising, raising disciples. Because I found in my own life and in our own ministry, we raised a lot of, in, instead of lifting up disciples, we were actually raising up a bunch of time bombs. Because there was little things that we decided that we didn't have enough love, we didn't have enough courage to talk about or deal with. And then all of a sudden, boom. And... What God has, for this time, this great time of harvest, this great time where God wants to show his power and his authority in favor of this church. Because, to be honest with you, when both Terry, when, when Terry came back from the first time he was among you and when we met John, it was like, wow, you guys got all this stuff going on. And this is, this is your philosophy of ministry. This is your, your, the philosophy of the way you've set the, the church up and, and home churches and, and emphasizing relationships and serving those mo most in need and, and receiving so much financing from the government to, to be able to minister to people. It's like, man, that's what we want to do, but we haven't quite managed. But you know, now, post-pandemically, with all the stress, people are more open than ever, ever. But, but God wants this church to be stronger than ever. God wants each of, of you to be, be participants in that. Amen? Amen. And I think it's going to take some binding and loosing. And then finally, what I call the big ought to. And, 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 I, and I love this because, you know, everybody knows John 3.16, 3, right? God so loved the world that whoever believeth in him should not perish but ha have everlasting life. Right? Sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. First John 3.16. That's kind of the scripture. But the Lord took me to 1 John 3.16. I don't think it's a coincidence that John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16 are totally related. And I love 1 John 3.16, which says, hereby perceive we the love of God. Here's how we perceive. Here's how we receive. Here's how we see the love of God. That if he laid down his life for us, we also ought to it's not a really a word we use for it. You ought to, well, maybe here in England you do. North America, we hardly ever use, you know, you ought to. Maybe in the South. But it's, it's a good word. It's a good form of the verb. We ought to lay down our lives for one another. It's really not an obligation. It's kind of an obligation. It's an ought to. It's not you have to, but you ought to. And uh, I think that's what the Lord's saying to life. Because that's, that's what you guys believe. That's what you guys have demonstrated and, and lived for during the years. That kind of covenant relationship where you really realize that, like it says in Philippians, don't look at your own interest, but look at the interest of your brother and sister. Don't value yourself. And boy, if a man like John comes amongst us, and humbly sits amongst us and doesn't just automatically want to take charge, <laughs> um, that's pretty humbling. But comes amongst us and sits with us and looks at our interests and our needs and ministers to us and receives from us, it's like, wow. And so he's demonstrated that to us, and I know he's demonstrated it to you as well. And I know he's, and the other members of the leadership have, have, have shared that value that really that's, that's what covenant relationships are all about, really laying down our lives for one another. And so that you would continue. Now, post-pandemically, that's become a lot more difficult, hasn't it? You have to be maybe a little bit more or a lot more intentional about 
continuing in that and deepening that because you kind of never arrive, do you? I mean, I, I love it when people go, well, how, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm doing really good. I, do you have any sin in your life? No, I don't have any sin in your life. Well, well, how are you doing on this one? Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your might. It's like, yeah, I'm doing that. It's like, really? How about the second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, yeah, I'm doing pretty It's like, never fail on that one, huh? I think that shows us all we need more of the grace of God, and there's areas we can grow in that area. And, and that's the exhortation. God has placed you in a time such as this so that you can share the gospel more often, say, here I am, Lord, send me, give me an opportunity today so you can bind and, and loose and, and be willing to come under that, even if it means wearing a tie and a jacket for 20 years <laughs> or maybe some other things that are a little more difficult. And also, really laying down your life for one another, continuing to do that. I believe that's what God is saying to Lifeline in these times. And I want to read a scripture that I think really speaks to that. It's from, because I know that you guys have been really wanting to move more in the spirit. And there's a scripture that talks about quenching the spirit, which is another scripture that's kind of taken out of context often. It's in Ephesians. And I, Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. And I, I really, only recently, like within the last few months, I've seen this in Scripture. You know, we've all seen that where it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. But the context of do not grieve the Holy Spirit and quenching the Holy Spirit and really allowing the Holy Spirit to move amongst us is, I, f I found very interesting. 4.29 in Ephesians, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And I think we all can get a, at least a little bit convicted by that, and maybe some of us a lot convicted by that. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And then in context, it continues to say, let our bitterness and wrath and anger, I got a big problem with that one, and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. And then it says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And I believe that's a word of exhortation for the church. And I just want to end with what God's going to do as we, as we do that more and more together. I uh, just want to read Psalm 133. Because I believe that's what God's going to bring more and more into reality. I mean, you guys are probably doing it more than anyone else I know, to be honest with you. And have done it, maybe more than anyone else I know. But, you know. We never arrive, do we? And maybe at this time we're challenged to let that, some of these incredible values and, and, and fundamentals that have been placed in the church, like, eh, you know, kind of, I mean, a lot of people came out of the pandemic and said, eh, maybe we don't need to meet together. Eh, maybe we don't. No, I think God's saying very clearly that not only do we need it, we need to emphasize it more than ever. Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. For it is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running, Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And, and God has commanded blessing as you come into unity and harmony and dwell together in that unity and harmony, applying some of these, these fundamentals that you have applied for years as a, as a community and as a family, God's gonna use you mightily in this time because you've been prepared and placed for a time such as this. Can we stand together? I'd just like to pray for you and bless you. Thank you so much. Lord, I, I thank you, Father, for 
setting this witness on the earth. This, this amazing testimony of your love, of your, of your grace, of your glory in Lifeline Ministry, Lifeline Church, Lord. I thank you for who they are. I thank you for what, they, what they're manifesting in this country. I thank you for the favor, Lord, and the position that you've given them. I thank you for the vision and heart that you've placed in this church. And I pray that, Lord, as they come out of this, of this time, this difficult time, and move forward even in, in maybe even more difficult times, that they would declare as you, as you ministered this morning that all we need is you, Lord. More of you, Lord Jesus. More of you, Lord Jesus. And that as we, Lord, share that with one another, God, and share that with others, Lord, speak your word, bringing faith to the hearers and salvation. Lord, even the, the least, Lord, in this wonderful church and in this kingdom is greater than all the prophets of the Old Testament because we have that honor and that pleasure. Anoint and that privilege, Lord. Anoint your people to share your word in power and authority. Bring people to the saving knowledge of you. Preach that good news. Lord, help us to come under authority, to be willing to not only receive correction, but also to correct, to open our hearts, that we would all be your disciples, Lord, growing in love together. And help this community and all of us, Lord, to, to walk in that covenant relationship, doing what we ought to do, laying down our lives for one another. Lord, may this church be blessed during this great time of opportunity by your Holy Spirit and by your grace. Amen. Thank you so much.